Until now, we've been talking about what are called homogeneous linear recurrences, pure linear recurrences. Uh, now let's uh, briefly talk about a, a, a variation called inhomogeneous, which in fact are much more general. So before we get started on that, let's go back and say exactly what a linear, recur linear recurrence is, since we never actually precisely defined it. So a function f on the non-negative integers is defined by a homogeneous linear recurrence of degree k when this function f satisfies the property that f of n plus 1 is simply a linear combination of the previous k values of f. So if I was writing that out as a formula, f of n plus 1 is equal to some constant times f of n plus a constant times f of n minus 1 down through a constant times f of n minus k. So I have the previous k values here that are combined with constants. So it's a linear function of those k values to get the n plus first value. So that's a homogeneous linear recurrence of degree k. Now we've seen one before, actually, very familiar one. The Fibonacci numbers, remember? Fib, fib of n plus 1 is equal to fib of n plus fib of n minus 1. And of course, it's degree 2, and the coefficients in both cases are 1. So c0 is 1 and c1 is 1. So that's an example of a homogeneous degree 2 recurrence that we've seen already. OK. Inhomogeneous just means that uh, there's something tacked on to the linear recurrence part. There's an extra term called g of n that gets added in when you're computing f of n plus 1, and that's called the inhomogeneous term. Of course, the rest is called the linear part. So let's now look at an example, uh, again, a little story that leads us to a natural inhomogeneous linear recurrence, and then we will talk about how to deal with it. And in fact, we can deal with it in much the way that we've dealt, dealt with homogeneous ones, at least if the uh, inhomogeneous term is not too weird. So let's take a look at the famous story of the Towers of Hanoi. So the story of the Towers of Hanoi is that there's a whole bunch of, of disks. This is cross sections of a bunch of disks that are sitting on a pole. Each desk has a hole in the middle, and they're of uh, decreasing size. And we can suppose there are n of these disks in the general case, going from bigger on the bottom to smallest on the top, and they sit on that pole. And the, the Tower of Hanoi is a puzzle that says, we want to get this entire stack of n disks moved on to the second post, subject to some constraints. First of all, we can only move one disk at a time. Uh, and we, our objective is to get the whole stack into uh, the second post, as I said. But the constraint is that when you put a disk down on a pole, you're not allowed to have a, uh, a larger disk resting on a smaller disk. That's the constraint. Is it possible to do? Can you move this whole stack over to that pole, moving one disk at a time and never having a big disk on top of a little disk? Well, let's play with an example. Suppose I have three disks. There's a picture of three disks, and uh, the, the smallest disk I can move anywhere. So let's suppose that I move the smallest disk to the third pole. OK. Now um, I can move the second largest disk anywhere, um, except onto the third pole where the little one is. So let's move it onto the second disk. And that gets me into this position where I have big, uh, medium, and small. OK, now I can move the small disk on top of the big disk, uh, the middle sized disk here, and I get this configuration. Yeah? So big disk, little disk on top of small disk on the second pole. What next? Well, next I'm going to move the big disk over to pole three. Yeah? And having moved the big disk over to pole, th pole, three, pole, uh, pole 3, I can now move the little disk from pole 2 into the empty pole 1, and I'm left with this configuration. And from here, it's trivial to see that I can move the middle size disk from the middle pole onto the uh, big disk on the third pole, and then move the little uh, disk and put it on top of that. And I have succeeded in moving the entire stack of 3 from the first pole to the third pole. Now, the objective was to move 
the first pole to the second pole, the, the stack on the first pole to the second pole, but clearly the poles are symmetrical. So anything that I could have done if I moved the first to the third, I could have just by reversing the role of the second and third have removed the first to the second. So that's the way it works in the n equals three case. And the question is, how do we do it in general? Well, in general, there's a simple recursive procedure, which actually turns out to be optimal, but we won't go into that now, for moving a stack of n disks from post one to post two. And the way we do it is we're gonna define the recursive procedure for moving a stack of n disks from post one to post two in terms of uh, the corresponding procedures to move a stack from one post to another when the stack is of size n minus one. Now, moving from one post to another post, it really doesn't matter what the posts are by symmetry, so it's perfectly okay to talk about solving one, two in terms of two, three, or one, three, or what have you, and that's what we're gonna do. So the way that we move a stack of n disks from post one to post two is I begin by recursively applying the procedure for moving n minus one disks and moving the top n minus one disks from post one to post three. Now that procedure for moving n minus one disks assumes that there are only n minus one disks around and really we're applying it when there's an n nth disk that's sitting here that's the biggest. However, since it's the biggest, it doesn't put any constraint on what we do on the remaining smaller n minus one disks. So I can perfectly well execute my strategy for moving n minus one disks from one pole to another. Uh, even if that big disk is sitting there. So my first step is move these top n minus one disks from post one to post three, if you can visualize that. What am I left with? I've got n minus one here and the big disk there. Now it's okay to move the big disk because there's nothing on top of it. And I can move the big disk from one to two. And now recursively, I can move this stack of n minus one disks onto post two where the big disk is sitting. And that's my strategy. The net result is that I've moved, in fact, the whole stack of n from the first pole to the second pole. Okay, it's very elegant and simple. The key observation is this business about the, the, the symmetry among the poles so that it's fine to, uh, to figure out how to do one, two in terms of doing one, three and three, two. All right, how many steps does this take? That's what we're really interested in. How many moves of disks does it require to carry out this procedure when you're trying to move a stack of n disks? Well, that's what leads me to this very elementary inhomogeneous linear recurrence. So if we let hn be the number of steps to move a stack of size n, then the way I'm doing uh, the stack of size n was I'm moving a stack of size n minus one, the top n minus disks, uh, one disks. I move them once to disk three, then I do one more move of the big disk, and then I move the stack of n minus one again from three to two. So in order to do one, uh, one uh, solution for a stack of n disks to get them moved from one pole to another, I have to move a stack of n minus one disks twice plus one additional move, and that's the recurrence hn in terms of two hn minus one plus one. So there's the linear part, it's degree one with the constant two, but the inhomogeneous part is there. This is not, this is what keeps it from being a linear function because I've got this inhomogeneous constant one, but that's all it is, it's just a constant and it's not too hard to cope with. All right, uh, by the way, uh, h zero is zero. We need that initial condition for h to be determined uniquely. Um, and uh, the, uh, the rationale here is that it doesn't take any moves to move no disks from one pole to another since you can't see what pole it's on anyway. May, you may as well think about it as being uh, on your favorite pole with zero disks. Okay, um, let's look at this generating function, h of x, where the coefficient of n of x squared is the number of steps it takes to move a stack of n disks. So it's h0 plus h1x, h2x squared, and so on. All right, 
Well, looking at the form of this recurrence and using the same kind of reasoning that we used to solve up the homogeneous case, what this suggests is that since hn is 2h minus 1, what I'd like to do is get this sequence shifted so that the hn minus 1s line up with the hn's and I double them. So what I'm going to do is apply the right shift operator. I'm going to multiply h of x by minus 2x and that has the useful effect that it shifts uh, under h1 a 2h0 and under h2 a 2h1 and so on. Um, and uh, that's the first step that we would have done if for in solving a homogeneous equation without the plus one. But now I have the plus one. These guys don't add to zeros yet. Uh, so if only I could get ones subtracted from these terms, then I would be in great shape because if I could do that, then when I added them up, these would all be zero. Where am I going to get these ones? Well, we know how to get ones. If I just subtract 1 over 1 minus x, that gives me the geometric series minus 1 minus 1x minus 1x squared. So I didn't really care about that one, it turns up, but, but I'm getting all the ones that I wanted in columns uh, 1 and 2 and so on. The result is that if I add them up now, um, all of the columns to the right of the first one sum to 0 and they can be erased because they're really not there. So let's clean up this uh, sum. And what I get is that um, all the stuff on the right disappears. And there's this one equality, h of x minus 2h of x minus 1 over 1 minus x is equal to h0 minus 1. So let's tidy that up. There it is, h of x minus 2h of x minus 1 over x is h0 minus 1. Now at this point, I might as well use the h0 and remember that it's 0. So this becomes a just a minus 1 over here. And now we do a little bit of algebra um, uh, simplification. I factor out uh, h of x and I transpose minus uh, 1 over 1 minus x to be 1 over 1 minus x minus 1. And if you put the 1 over the 1 minus x, you wind up with h of x times 1 minus 2x is equal to x over 1 minus x. Now just divide through by 1 minus 2x and we wind up with our final uh, solution for h of x. There is the generating function for the Hanoi moves. h of x is x over 1 minus x times 1 minus 2x. Now, I don't know whether you remember this, but we actually used this very example in a previous video when we were trying to illustrate the partial fraction method. And we already figured out what the, uh, the coefficient of uh, what hn is, what's the coefficient of x to the n in this generating function, namely it's 2 to the n minus 1. So it takes 2 to the n minus 1 moves to move a stack of n disks. And that means that once you start getting a lot of disks, this is going to become a prohibitive procedure because of the exponential growth. Now, the point then is that we really are using the same method to solve inhomogeneous uh, linear recurrences uh, as we did for the homogeneous ones, uh, as long as the inhomogeneous term was simply a constant. Right? We could do that. Uh, anything that was of the form f is the linear part plus a constant we knocked off. And the way we handled the constant was we had a generating function for the sequence of constants, namely the constant over 1 minus x. But that means if you think about it, what's special about a constant? Nothing. Suppose that instead of a constant, I happen to have, let's say, a term alpha to the n instead of a constant. Well, I could get a generating function for alpha to the n. It's simply 1 over 1 minus alpha x. We knew that. And so I can handle uh, a linear recurrence with an inhomogeneous term that's of the form alpha to the n. In fact, I can handle one where the inhomogeneous term is the, is the, uh, is the identity function n because we have the generating function for n. We figured that out already. It was x. Uh, over 1 minus x squared. And uh, likewise, uh, there's a form, there's a generating function for the squares, which is x times 1 plus x over 1 minus x squared. Uh, it's an easy exercise to derive that in uh, using the perturbation method or taking derivatives. Lots of ways to do it. And more generally, we can handle any inhomogeneous term of the form 
alpha to the n times n to the k, where the k is a fixed uh, constant like n squared n cubed. And of course, that means that once I have these, I can also handle any sum of these, uh, which means I can really handle alpha to the n times any polynomial and a sum of those for different alphas and different polynomials. And all of those get handled by uh, using a suitable quotient of polynomials as to handle uh, the generation of the inhomogeneous terms that I need as coefficients of the powers of x. So that's the general story for handling a pretty decently large class of inhomogeneous linear recurrences. Now, there's a lot of other nasty inhomogeneous terms that this method doesn't uh, handle, and there's lots of tricks for dealing with uh, more general kinds of inhomogeneous terms, and for that matter, for uh, other kinds of recurrences that are not linear. But I think we've seen enough to get a sense of the power and elegance of generating functions. So that's gonna we'll, so we'll stop our pure investigation of generating functions here, uh, but we will be using them actually to solve some linear recurrences when we take up our next topic of probability theory.